Hey, it's the Good Advice Show. Thanks for checking out another episode of our humble little podcast. Continuing to publish episodes on a weekly basis, giving you good advice wherever you are in your business. If you're a first-time listener, hey, thank you. Thank you for checking out our podcast. And uh, I hope that you enjoy your stay today, your little auditory stay, if I may say. Uh, maybe that's maybe I'm getting too complicated in the intro here. <laughs> but hey, I appreciate you being here. You could be listening to any number of podcasts, and you chose this one today. Thank you for that. I am your host, Blake Benz. I run a business called Good Advice. I've been running the podcast for a few years now. We got 300 episodes. It's a nice little labor of love. And hey, you're here for it. So today we're going to be talking about some things in the news. Unfortunately, a business that I have loved for years. I've talked about them for forever now. They've been really like a bastion of innovation, agility, um, culture even. I've talked about them. We're talking about a household name, Netflix. And some drama that's going on with Netflix. Some things that have happened with Netflix in um, some stuff over the last several months, but especially in the most recent week. And specifically why Netflix may be on the downturn. We may actually see Netflix no longer be the household name that I think it was just three or four years ago. And we may see some, some new things coming in. So... All that's on the show today. Before we jump in, we are going to run a quick ad. It helps keep our podcast going. So in a second, we're going to have a word from one of our sponsors. And of course, if you run a small business and you want to have your business talked about on the podcast with one of these nice, snazzy little ad reads, you can email me, Blake, at goodadvicecoaching.com. Having said that, here's a quick word from an amazing business. Check it out. Hey, have you been thinking about your health insurance plan for this next year? Maybe you just jumped to the world of entrepreneurship and you're thinking, geez, is it possible to have a good insurance plan if I'm no longer working for a business? Maybe you're even running a business and you're thinking about what does it look like to have an affordable group plan for your employees? Well, I want to tell you about Optimum Health Insurance. This is a customized health care plan for you and your family. And since 2018, they've been helping people get awesome, affordable health care coverage for really nothing at all. It's easy, it's hassle-free, and frankly, they're different from the big insurance companies that you might talk to. And crazy enough, you might even be paying less than what you've paid at a previous job when you were on some company health insurance plan. If you want to find out more and save money on your health insurance, you absolutely need to go check out OptimumHealthInsurancePlan.com. That's OptimumHealthInsurancePlan.com. That's today's sponsor. Enjoy this episode. Yeah, so if you didn't see this in the news this last week, Netflix, and, and actually as I was telling this to my wife, I think she thought I was joking because the headline is basically insane. Uh what made the news this last week is that Netflix will basically try to ban your account for account sharing. And just to get like terminology out there, account sharing is when you pay for a Netflix service and you let someone else use it uh, who isn't paying for their own service. Uh, this is a, I would call it a household thing. There's a multitude of families who are like, you know, mom and dad have the Netflix accounts. Maybe the sister has the Hulu accounts. Maybe, um, you know, one family, they have the Disney Plus account and everyone just swaps in between one another. And naturally, I understand why this is an issue for some of these businesses, because streaming has become such a massive thing. It's likely no longer as profitable as it was maybe six, seven, eight years ago. And especially if you're a company like Netflix, who for years now has been spending a lot of their own money producing their own films, they absolutely probably don't have the cash that they used to. So what's one of the easiest ways, ways to rectify that? One, you can raise prices. Or two, you can turn your, let's just say, 10 million accounts. It's a made-up number. I don't know how many they have. 10 million accounts that's being used by 40 million people. And instead, force those people to all use their own accounts, which naturally would be a massive boon for your, your income, right? 
Now, I will say I have been less and less excited about Netflix over the last several years. And as a disclaimer, I've talked about them on the show a number of times. They have done so many things right. I think the Netflix versus Blockbuster story is just a great it's a great example of how small businesses can win. And it's a great reminder for what we should avoid as longer running business owners in terms of avoiding um, things that just no longer work, uh, getting stuck in our ways, getting disconnected from what our customers really want. Uh, One example I think of for that is um, when it came to the Blockbuster store and the reason they didn't go digital, there was a lot of marketing around our customers love coming to the store. It's a community event. You'll see your neighbor there. Like there's something that's irreplaceable about coming in and browsing the aisles, seeing all the options, seeing people, and it's just a great thing. This is from Blockbuster's point of view. Turns out that's not the case. What most people prefer is being in their pajamas and binge watching like, you know, the latest Stranger Things season or whatever it is you watch. And, uh, and never seeing anybody, <laughs> you know, like it turns out that's what people really wanted. Now it's not to say that Blockbuster didn't do their homework, but having lived in a time where I remember going to Blockbuster, I remember going to, um, the, the, uh, movie rental place. We had one near my house called premier video and it was, it shared a building with Domino's. And so we would go get movies and then we'd get pizza. And it was fun. It really was fun. Like I would remember getting excited to go. However, I could definitely see someone like Blockbuster, like sort of cherry picking the data being like, oh, they really love this. It's like, yeah, I did like that. But what I love is the Netflix model access to anything that I want right now. And frankly, there's no late fees. And actually back when Netflix was a DVD, I remember how infinitely more excited I was about it when I found out that I could keep the DVD that came in the mail and I wasn't going to get, you know, um, totally busted for crazy late fees charges. Like I remember just when I found out that I could keep this as long as I wanted, but I just couldn't get the next one until I returned it. Like it blew my mind. So I think Blockbuster probably really cherry picked the data. And the reason for that is because we also know from Blockbuster that a large portion of their revenue came from late fees. So it's like, did your customers really love coming to the store? Maybe, but I think you as a business, what you loved more was money, (laughs) getting those late fees and just how massively successful it was for your, your revenue. So we've talked about Blockbuster a lot. We've talked about Netflix in terms of like their management strategy, their culture strategy, um, how transparent they are and candid, like how these are like linchpins of their internal structure, all good things for businesses. But I, I'll be honest, I've, I've definitely soiled on, I've become a bit spoiled on soiled is a totally different thing, which sounds kind of weird now. <laughs> I I've been definitely spoiled on Netflix, um, in recent years because of the constant price increases. I remember Netflix when it was like eight or nine dollars a month. I think now it's like 18, 19, 20 dollars for like the highest option. I can't remember. And there have been a multitude of times where I've been like, why am I paying for this? Like how and just how little time am I actually spending on Netflix? Now, it's pretty interesting, too, because I remember when some of these competitors were popping up, it was like there's no room for these competitors Netflix is like absolutely the king. I remember even when Disney Plus popped up, it was like, you know, why would I watch Disney Plus? I mean, seriously, like is Disney just like money grabbing here? And hats off to Disney. I spend more time on Disney than I do at all on Netflix. Uh, In fact, I think I spend more time on these other things. I think of Amazon Prime and Hulu. I spend infinitely more time on there than Netflix. In fact, the only time I think I ever really watch Netflix is during the holiday season because of the really awful Christmas movies that my wife is a glutton for punishment for. If you've ever checked these out, they're pretty bad. But, um, you know, I, I don't know. It's like a it's like a, a guilty habit that my wife has. So all this to say, I've already been I've already, I've already been feeling kind of negative about Netflix in recent years. Well, so I see this headline that pops up this last week that basically says Netflix will ban you for account sharing. And like I mentioned, I get why they're doing it. It makes sense um, because it's it's one of the biggest detractors for their own revenue. But streaming services sharing accounts is so 
it's so synonymous with like what this product is like, it's just like a cultural thing at this point. Like, yeah, I'll give you my Netflix password. Yeah. I can, you know, I think about my neighbor actually, like we have our own Disney plus now, but we still have our neighbor's Disney plus, which, you know, uh, don't come after my neighbor, please Disney. <laughs> but it, for him, it was like, before we had our own, he was like, Oh yeah, you can use mine. Don't worry. Don't worry about it. No big deal. And so this is like very much a cultural thing. Now it's what people kind of associate with the service. So Netflix comes out this past week and they basically say, Here's what we're doing to lock down on account sharing. Whenever someone logs in to your Netflix account, if it is not through your home router, which they can see, by the way, they can see your IP address, you know, where you're logging in from. If it's not from your home router, we will lock your account. Um, and actually, the headline I read was that they were they would ban your account for violating terms of service for, you know, account sharing, basically. So what that would mean literally would be like, let's say you own your Netflix account and you let like your sister use it. Who's maybe like a state away or a few hours away. Every 30 days, your sister would have to travel to your home, log in on whatever device they use to log in. So their laptop computer, whatever. Uh, and then they can go back to, you know, watching it at their home for the next 30 days. So I think this is going to, totally going to change family gatherings where it's like, um, we're all getting together for like Thanksgiving. And then people are like, Hey, really quick. I need to log into, I need to log into your Netflix here so that I can get my fix for the next month of December. Now this would be insane. This isn't going to happen because no one's that obsessed with Netflix, but I kind of wonder like, would this ever happen where people now are like, Oh yeah, I need to log in. I need to log in. I need to get online. But as you can imagine, people were super pissed off about it. No one liked this. And frankly, it's 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 so countercultural in terms of like what people come to expect streaming services to look like that, um, you know, I, I don't see it going well at all for Netflix. And in fact, I saw a headline this morning that, and in fact, did not go well for Netflix, that they've already backpedaled. They said they've already gotten so many mass cancellations of their services that they are rethinking the strategy. Now, I think they actually said they're delaying it. They're going to look at it again, which typically means they backpedal for PR. And when I say they, I mean like corporations in general. Corporations in general will back off to let the PR kind of simmer a bit, and then they will quietly roll it out later when people aren't as upset or kind of the rage has passed about it. Now, I don't see them fully backing out on it. And I also don't think that Netflix is the only company who's considered this. Sometimes what happens in like these big, what feels like anti-consumer strategies is one brand tanks, one brand takes the fall to be innovative. And they're the ones who are the major focus point of like the negative PR, but then other companies start to follow suit. So like, for example, think about your phone, not having a headphone jack, which now that I say that I think about, does my phone have a headphone jack? Uh, it does not no headphone jack on my phone. So I remember, and I have a, I have an Android, I have a Samsung, but I remember when Apple came out with one of the new iPhones and they're like, Hey, we're getting rid of the headphone jack. And people were pissed. They were so upset about it and they continued on with it. Well, what did the other companies do? In fact, I think Samsung that next year was like, and we have a headphone jack for ours. So they, they used it to, you know, really flip it against Apple but I think it was like the model after that, that they themselves quietly got rid of it as well. So I am curious if Netflix is going to take the fall for this, but we might see some other brands kind of continue with this. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised in five years time if like account sharing is totally gone. Uh, or if some other competitor pops up and says like, yeah, you are welcome to, um, you know, do this as much as you want. We don't care. So I think despite this, though, one of the takeaways from this is how companies that are great don't always stay great, which is kind of common sense. But think about brands that you loved as a kid that you were just you just adored. And then like years later, you came back to it and you were like, Ugh, like what happened here? Like I think about a restaurant that is down the street from me that 10 years ago was so amazing. And then I remember taking my wife there. Um, 
I took my wife there and it was, it was just gross. Like I was like, what happened to this place? Like, this is not, I mean, it really fell into disrepair. And I even think about other companies like Best Buy is a company that I loved as a kid. I mean, I'd go to like, check out the video games. I just, I've always loved technology. And so I'd go to check out like, you know, even walking down the aisles of like the different cameras and laptops and computers and all these different things that they had. I loved Best Buy as a kid. Well, now I, I almost never will ever go to Best Buy. If I can avoid shopping as be- at Best Buy, it's a win for me because I, I just frankly despise Best Buy. Um, same thing with like Dell computers. I remember as a kid, we get a Dell computer. I thought, I even remember that you guys remember the commercial, by the way, where the guy was like, dude, you're getting a Dell. <laughs> like, do you guys remember that? Like with the person, uh, I mean, literally that was the whole thing. It was kind of like, can you hear me now? Is like how like stuck in my memory it is, but you're like, dude, you're getting a Dell. Like that was such a, you know, it just, it was so pingy. It just worked. And then now I just associate Dell with like, you know, yeah, it's, it's a cheap product. It's overpriced. It sucks. Um, just my opinion, but that's just my personal experience with it. So, uh, and then other restaurants, you know, I think of like restaurants that are no longer around today or just businesses are, I think of circuit city no longer around, um, Sears no longer around, like you might remember like the Sears, uh, catalog during the holiday and like just how amazing that was. Um, Kodak having a Kodak camera. I mean, these businesses that are just so freaking great and yet years later fade away into nothing. Uh, even Southwest airlines, which I've talked about for years, uh, not just on like even pre good advice, but I've even talked to them, talked about them on the podcast and how like amazing they are and like all of like how customer centric they are. Well, in this last holiday season, we saw that they had this massive set of cancellations, people who couldn't get to where they needed to go during the holidays, their luggage got lost, or it took forever to get their luggage. And it, it, I was really shocked by it. In fact, a lot of people working within uh, Southwest, there were like, there was a pilot, for example, who did kind of like a tell all story that basically said that what is the norm for other airlines? Like, for example, like if, if a pilot's sick, most airlines have like a backup crew ready to go in a main location. So if you're flying out of Chicago, pilot gets sick, that crew is ready on call, which is obviously a bit more expensive for the airline because they have to pay that crew as well. Well, apparently what Southwest would do is they wouldn't have that backup crew ready, but instead they would try to bring people in. It was kind of like, um, you know, a complicated scheduling thing where it's like, let's bring these other people in. And also all this, all this on top of the fact that their computer system was apparently data technology. Again, this is all just like hearsay stuff that I've just like read myself. So uh, take it with a grain of salt, but bottom line, the practices that are the norm in other airlines are not the norm in Southwest. And apparently it seems like the, it's not the norm because they've been trying to cut cost. So here's this brand that was so well known for being like the best airline. Like I knew people who were like, I will only fly Southwest. Uh, And I remember even being younger thinking like, oh man, I wish NWA had Southwest airlines. They're amazing. And now they're, they're in a pretty negative spotlight. So this is just the norm for our lives. I mean, we're going to continue to see businesses that were once great, no longer be great. And actually one of my favorite books is called good to great. It's from Jim Collins. It's about a set of businesses, uh, I think in the late nineties, early two thousands who were amazing, um, and why they were amazing. Well, one of the criticisms, criticisms, criticisms of that book is that a lot of those businesses are no longer around. Like circuit city is one of the businesses named in that book. We all know circuit city is non-existent. It doesn't exist anymore. So people have been like, oh, I guess they weren't really that great because they're no longer around. And I remember Jim Collins responded with like, well, just because you are great doesn't mean you'll stay great. And I think that's totally true, you know, and 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 we're seeing this with Southwest. We're seeing it with Netflix. We're going to see it with many more brands as the years come and go. So what's the takeaway here? What do you do with this? The takeaway, I think, is no matter how big your business is. First of all, nothing's guaranteed. And you already know this because every business owner has gone out and clawed for every customer that they have. They've clawed for every ounce of success that they have. They've really worked hard to make their business successful. But I think sometimes what happens is once you experience some success, you, I don't know if it's laziness or um, casualness, 
But I think that zest for really chasing after customers fades and we lose our appreciation for what got us there in the first place. Like I, I've really been cognizant of the fact of um, like I just I, I added a new customer this past week and very cheap customer in the sense of like what they're paying is significantly less than what an average customer would pay for. And I remember I, I, the customer came in and every customer gets an onboarding message from me, but this customer, I did a video on board and I basically said, Hey, thanks for choosing good advice. And I, I said this person's name. So it wasn't like a canned, like recorded response. Um, his name was Justin. And I, I said, Hey, Justin, Hey, I just want to take a second and tell you, thank you for investing in good advice. Like this means a lot to me. And I, um, I, I appreciate your trust in me. Like, I don't take that lightly. And I want to just tell you what you can expect over the coming weeks. And so it was a quick video, three or four minutes, send it off to him. Well, I get a text from him that's like, hey, that was a nice touch. And it's like, yeah, of course it's a nice touch because I, I showed intentionality and said, hey, whether you spend $500 or $5,000, your investment matters to me. I think this is a key insight for how you build raving fans in your business. It's, it's how you build a long-standing business versus the brand who stops doing these things because they no longer make sense at scale. You know, at a certain point, your business gets so large that it's hard to take the time to send off that kind of video, but that is what made you successful in the first place. So it's understanding that although your business needs you to be in a scaling mindset, you can't lose those things that are a bit countercultural to scaling. You can't lose those things that created the fanfare for your brand in the first place. Um, I still send uh, letters to people. I still send um, like individual messages to people. And I'm continuing to challenge myself to do that. I have a person who, who I owe a thank you letter to who I haven't sent yet. And I'm really getting after myself for it. It's like, I should have sent that a month ago. Like that needs to get sent ASAP because I owe it to that person. Uh, even though that person didn't spend any money on my brand. So, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with Netflix and some of these other brands. But regardless of that, I think if nothing else, it gives you an in for success when you can position your customer as your number one priority. A lot of people say that that's the case. They, they say, you know, it's like whenever, and I've talked about this before, they say, oh, our customers are our number one priority or like our, our customer service is, is the best. But then you talk to their customers and they're like, yeah, I mean, it's like any other business. Very few businesses are actually giving an extraordinary experience in customer service. Like, let me say that again. Very few businesses are actually giving an amazing customer experience. The ones that are actually doing it, they have figured out the secret to intentionality, genuineness, and ultimately communicating what their customers really care about and putting that at the forefront of what they're doing. So. Hey, that's today's good advice. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. If you want to chat with me about what you think about the episode, you can always email me at blake at goodadvicecoaching.com. More importantly, if you're thinking about advertising at all for this next year, I'd love to have your business talked about on the podcast. Again, you can email me blake at goodadvicecoaching.com. Or if you want to just support the podcast, you're like, hey, Blake, I appreciate what you're doing. You want to throw me a couple bucks, you can go to my Patreon. It's at patreon.com slash goodadvice. Thank you guys so much for supporting the podcast, for supporting the show. It means a lot to me. Thank you so much. Uh, and I don't take it lightly. So that's today's episode. We'll catch you later. That's today's good advice. See ya.